Our next uh, presentation is by Sylvain Henry. He is an engineer at IOG, where he's been primarily responsible for the new GHC backend for JavaScript. Additionally, he's worked on GHC BigNum, on various compiler optimizations in the past, and he has a background in high-performance computing, so he's got a lot of really great skills to bring to bear on this. Um, but I think that the WebAssembly and JavaScript backends are some of the most important things happening for the future of Haskell. I'm very happy that both Cheng and Sivan agreed to come help out and present on this, and I hope that we'll get lots of wonderful contributions. So uh, please join me in thanking him. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. So let's get started. So about the JavaScript backend. Uh, so yeah, as you all know, we have uh, two new backends that uh, just arrived. The WebAssembly backend presented yesterday, and the JavaScript backend that I will present now. So let's start first with some motivation. Uh, why do we want to have web backends to begin with? So it's only one slide, don't worry. Um, so the usual thing you might think about is to, to do front-end front -end web programming. So you have your, your server code written in Haskell, and you want your front-end code to be also written in Haskell, so that when you make some change in your backend, the compiler helps you uh, updating also your, your front-end. So that's one point. And the second point is also uh, it's common nowadays to distribute uh, application with a nice uh, graphical user interface that are, in fact, um, uh, JavaScript application uh, which are embedded with a JavaScript engine, so typically in Node.js, and uh, with a, uh, yeah, um, web rendering engine, so HTML, CSS uh, engine. So to, yeah, the most used project is Electron.js, and there is also NWJS. So these two things are uh, things that uh, the current Haskell ecosystem is bad at. Um, so it's rated immature on the state of Haskell ecosystem wiki page. Um, and so we're trying to fix this. And uh, yeah, we're trying to fix this directly in GHC because it was already possible to do something, but uh, using external projects such as uh, GHCGS that I will talk about more in this talk, and Asterius, also done by Cheng, uh, which he mentioned yesterday. So the first question that everyone is asking is, do we really need two backends? Why not uh, only have one, uh, and especially the WASM backend, because it's uh, shiny new things? So it's practical for me that uh, Cheng did the WASM uh, talk yesterday, because it should be quite clear now that WebAssembly is not a direct replacement for JavaScript. It's quite a different thing. Uh, it's not like uh, ASM.js, if you're aware about this. It's, it's, it's not really JavaScript. So it's, it's WebAssembly and JavaScript are really two different targets. And uh, yeah, interactive with, interacting sorry, with um, JavaScript code uh, might be more difficult from WebAssembly, for example. So yeah, there are different targets. Uh, the two backends are totally independent. So the implementations uh, are in, not the same. And there are different trade-offs in the choices we've made. Um, OK, so the JavaScript backend specificities I will talk about. Uh, first is that we have our own runtime system that is written, written sorry, in JavaScript. Um, another specificity is that it's the first GHC backend that targets a managed platform. So we'll see what it means. Um, the third point is that JavaScript is quite easy to hack and to observe. Um, that was mentioned yesterday that WebAssembly, as it's a compiled language, also um, is yeah, it's more um, it's, uh, what do you say? It's quite fixed. You can easily tweak it. While uh, JavaScript, you can do everything you want. Uh, yeah. What makes JavaScript a bad programming language makes it quite a good uh, <laughs> language to debug. In fact, and the fourth point is that JHCJS um, already proved that uh, we could use an Haskell to JavaScript toolchain in production. So it's pretty reassuring uh, to, uh, to know this before starting. OK, so the first point I mentioned is that we have a new RTS written in Haskell, in, Haskell, in JavaScript. So holds the uh, all the other backends, the native code generators, the C backends, the LLVM backends, they all use the RTS written in C. 
that has been presented by Ben uh, yesterday. Um, the JS backend, on the other hand, and the JHS uh, project have uh, their own uh, RTS written in JavaScript. Asterius uh, used to have its own uh, RTS written in JavaScript, but the WASM backend now is also reusing the C1, which he, 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 it compiles to WebAssembly. Uh, so what is what I think is cool with uh, having a uh, own uh, run runtime system written in JavaScript is that we have full control with the, with the code that is in it. Uh, we don't rely on external tooling uh, to convert uh, from the, for example, the CRTS to the JavaScript one. So yeah, we have full control. We can do uh, exactly what we want. So it's more more work, but more control, and it's quite analogous to the. Um, the native code generator where we directly generate assembly in GHC uh, compared to other backends like the C backend, LLVM backends, which rely on, which rely on uh, external tooling. So um, we may think, yeah, let's use LLVM and it uh, will get everything for free. But in, in some cases, it's not totally true because we have to tweak LLVM and to adapt to its limitation. So here with the JavaScript backend, we are more in the first case, we're controlling everything. So let's start um, by showing some code. Oh, I should have mentioned it. I've shared the link to the example uh, I will show uh, present here. So if you want to follow along and build the thing I build uh, as I will do, feel free. Um, so let's see. Let's see the RTS. So I have a, a checkout of GHC here. Uh, if I go into the RTS directory, there is a CRTS, but there is a JS directory that contains the JavaScript runtime system. Um, yeah, so we'll see some part of it later, but uh, yeah, it's usual JavaScript. Uh, yeah. With some special thing, we can use CPP in JavaScript, in whole JavaScript, but yeah. Um, okay, and so in the rts.cabal file, uh, we should have, yeah. We have a conditional if we are building for a JavaScript target. So yeah, there is a bug, but uh, we have some uh, some uh, stanza for JavaScript sources. So we include all these sources instead of the C1. Uh, it's similar to the yeah, the C1. Yeah, we have the header. Yeah. Basically, we include the JavaScript file. <coughs> So I've said also that uh, the JavaScript backend is the first, at least in GHC, uh, to target a managed platform. So what does it mean? Um, JavaScript has its uh, own heap, its own heap objects, and its own garbage collector, and we will reuse this in the JavaScript backend. Um, so this has some consequences uh, in the way we use Haskell. So I don't know if everyone is aware, but uh, in uh, Haskell, we have pointers just like in C. And so uh, this is the address hash uh, primitive tip, which is usually uh, uh, embedded into a pointer uh, data type. And so when we are targeting uh, JavaScript, it's, it becomes a, a bit of an issue because we don't have uh, pointers in JavaScript. So we have to emulate uh, uh, pointers. Um, so this works, but uh, not always because uh, 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 we can't represent um, uh, pointers as numbers when we are in the JavaScript backend. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the, the, the one of the first change uh, that we have to think about uh, when we want to target uh, some managed platform. Uh, another one, uh, Chang alluded to this uh, yesterday, is that um, as we were targeting a managed uh, platform. When we want to refer to, ex to objects that already exist in the JavaScript heap, for example, um, we, need a, we need to have a type to represent this. And currently, we don't have this in uh, Haskell. Um, so it would be good to have a new primitive type, uh, such as manage ref, or it was called JSVAL in uh, JS, to represent a um, JavaScript object that we could use in our Haskell code. So they would be opaque to, to Haskell codes but you, you will be able to store them into uh, your data object, your, yeah, in, into your, your code. 
Um, another change is that in Haskell, we easily rely on a C, a C code to uh, and a FFI imports to do uh, things we can easily do in Haskell or, or that we want to make fast. So uh, it's an issue also for the JavaScript backend because uh, we don't uh, compile C to JavaScript. So uh, every time we have a C import, uh, yeah, it will fail. We'll have to replace it either with some Haskell code or with some uh, JavaScript code manually, at least for now. So uh, yeah, that's something that we have, we'll have to think about. Um, an example of, uh, of some change we've made is that in JavaScript big num, so um, Haskell provide big numbers, big uh, integer, uh, big uh, natural, and uh, that's the JavaScript big num library that does this. And the way it does this, usually it's by using the um, GMP uh, library. Uh, so it's an external library, and we don't have this for, ja for JavaScript. So three, of, three years ago, no, I, I've worked on uh, implementing a new backend for JavaScript big num that would be implemented in Haskell. So if we select this when we when we use the JavaScript backend, we don't have to to worry. We're compiling a usual Haskell code, so it just works. And so uh, this uh, all this change, at least in the way we think, and the, the change that will be forced on the on Haskell libraries, will make uh, implementing uh, other backend easier. So this is the first uh, call to action. If you want to start implementing a JVM backend or CLR backend. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can. There, there was a, a fork of a GSC called ETA that targeted the JVM. So uh, if you want to revive it, uh, we, can, uh, we can help. Uh, uh, and what we, we, we have done and what we were doing will make things easier to do. So could be cool. And the third point I mentioned before is that uh, the JS backend generates uh, JavaScript code and we have full control of the tool chain. So we have a full observability of um, of um, yeah, the code we generate, we can easily modify it after it has been compiled. Um, so it's quite useful to to learn about how the the STG machine execute uh, code um, and yeah, and to to dump things interactively and to debug the, also <laughs> the the code we have. And it's allow, it's also allow, allows us to. Um, to reuse all the JavaScript tools that we have, that are available, such as profiler and debuggers. So we'll do the first demo to, to do this. Okay. So let's go. So we have a simple program. So we, we have a simple function foo that uh, computes um, the sum of uh, some in64 numbers, and we, we just print it. So done program. So we can call GHC. Let's do this uh, with some optimization. So this is just native code, so it works, no problem. No, so no, let's uh, let's use the JavaScript backend. So I have already built uh, built it so, uh, here. So I'm defining the GHC JS uh, alias. Uh, to be able to, to, to use it. So, okay, it works. And, oops. And it works. So, uh, yeah, next step is that, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, let's see. So, uh, what we have just been running is, in fact, uh, JavaScript uh, script, um, which uh, with the, the which is ex executed in uh, Node.js. Uh, so, what is size? oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Please repeat the question. Uh, what's the size of the file? Uh, two megabytes. <laughs> but I will come back to this uh, later because uh, yeah, that's uh, a concern. Um, so. Let's do something. I, I will introduce uh, just right now this flag, the disable just minifier. Yep, minifier, which uh, makes the, the code a little bit more readable. You you keep the indentation and uh, 
there is less renaming. Um, okay, so this is um, the main uh, the main uh, product of the compilation. This, this, this script, but there are in fact other ones in a directory called uh, some in sixty four js exe. So let's see. Um, so we can start with, for example, lib.js. So this file will contain all the, um, uh, the um, JS sources that we have defined, uh, for example, in the RTS package. They will all be combined into this file um, by the linker. Um, then we have, for example, out.js. So this is the code that the code generator will generate for your Haskell code, from your Haskell code into JavaScript. Uh, so we will get back to this. Um, what's interesting in there? We have this thing, rts.js. So, in fact, the RTS is uh, partly defined as a manually written JavaScript uh, in the RTS um, uh, package. But also, some, uh, some code is gener generated uh, at link time just because it's boring to write. Uh, it's, uh, it's very similar to genapply, the genapply uh, utility that Jashi has for the native RTS. Uh, we don't want to generate all the, the apply function. Uh, yeah, I can't even find them, but yeah. Um, okay. Then we have run main. This, this is our, ent our entry point uh, to run the program. Um, and we have all.js. That is the concatenation of all this, this uh, JavaScript file together. Uh, with the entry point at the end. Uh, no, what's more trending also? Question. Yeah. What is actually getting run when you run the binary? Is it that all.js file? Uh, is it something else? <laughs> or? Um, yeah, uh, in fact, the binary here is uh, all.js with a line added at the top oh, to okay. run Node.js. So, so it's fully self contained, but I it's see. exactly. Uh, all the JS. Uh, then, then everything in the .js exe directory, those are sort of like temporary files that aren't actually used, but are just for like informative purposes. Yeah, informative, and also it may depend on, uh, on what, what uh, your use case is uh, in the end, because uh, you, mm, yeah, uh, let's see, we have index.html, which imports uh, all the .js, but perhaps that's not what you will do in the end. You will want to combine packages manually, thing like that. Okay. So it may be useful to have this artifact uh, independently. Are, are there flags that sort of like only generate uh, the build artifacts you need for certain things to save on disk space? So uh, there are options in the compiler, but they are not exposed as flags yet. So they were just a JS option at the time, but uh, we haven't yet changed the JSC interface too much yet. I see. Thank you. Welcome. And yeah, so this index.html file uh, is really to quickly test something in, into the browser. Uh, so actually, that's the next step. So let's do this. Yeah, Chromium. Yep. No, wrong window. Yeah. So it doesn't actually show anything because uh, the HTML file is uh, empty. But if we go into the console, we, we can see that uh, the result has been put in. So yeah, it's very small. I don't know if I can. Oh, yeah, I can. Um, yeah. And what we can do, it's a little bit too big now. Uh, we can uh, actually use the profiling tool directly. Uh, yep. Oh, it's too big. How do I? <laughs> I don't know how to reduce the size. Let's see. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's not. <laughs> no. I'll just restart. Uh, where was it? Uh, here. The beginning tool. Oh no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway. Oh, we can use the mouse. It's the future. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, no, not this. So where are our thing? No, we want a performance thing summary. Yeah. So uh, we can get a um, yeah, flame graph and things like that uh, uh, for our Haskell code, uh, reusing uh, JavaScript debug, de debug profiling tools. Uh, so we can see we, in the Haskell code, we've seen that we were using uh, uh, in 64 operation, uh, subtraction, addition. And so we, we see things like that, um, wishy functions that, uh, that implement this. So we'll look at this now. Um, so let's first look at STJ. Um, so we use ddump STG final ddump to. Oh, yeah. Is there anything like source mapping or something for those names that would translate them back into more readable Haskell names? Not, not yet, but okay. uh, that's a contribution that someone could make uh, <laughs> during the workshop or during the React. It was actually David's suggestion <laughs> to do this. Um, so yeah, let's see, I've dumped uh, an STG file. So when we see that we have this module, we use D no type of all uh, lines. This is uh, yeah, to make the code easier to read. So, okay, so uh, we have our full function, uh, which unpack uh, two i64 um, uh, data constructor to extract the primitive uh, value, the unlifted value, sorry. And then uh, we call this uh, function. So this is, in fact, uh, an example of the worker wrapper transformation that has been presented by Sebastian uh, uh, two days ago. Um, and yeah, and so what is interesting here is that we, we have our primitives uh, sub int 64 and a plus int 64. And we'll see how this, got, this gets translated into JavaScript. Uh, so let's go into the compiler. Um, yeah. So, the, the, the file that contains all the premops is this one, GHC built in premops uh, txt.pp. And uh, yeah, we're on the right line because I've prepared. Um, so we can see all the. Uh, uh, not, yeah. We have the list of all the premops that GHC defined. And uh, the one we are interested in is in, for example, uh, sub in 64. And um, uh, we have its type, and then in the compiler. So this is what will appear in the in, in Haskell sources, or in STG, in core, and in STG. But then it's transformed into uh, this uh, uh, this identifier. So in sixty four sub up. So let's see in sixty four sub up. Yeah. So we'll track uh, how this. Uh, Primop is compiled into JavaScript. So uh, in 64 sub up is defined is in the, the file we just looked at. It's also used in the console folding uh, in core optimization. And in STG to CMM, this is when we are using all the other backends. And for uh, the JavaScript backend is defined, it's used, sorry, in a STG to JS prim. So let's have a look. So yeah, so here we have the, um, the, the primop. So when we want to compile uh, some code using this primop, we are actually generating this, this JavaScript uh, code here. So an application of the JavaScript function hs minus uh, in 64. Um, one thing to notice is that in JavaScript, we can't really represent uh, 64 uh, um, numbers. Uh, so we use two variables to represent a single uh, 64 value. So we have the higher part, the lower part for the result, higher part, lower part for the first uh, argument, higher part, lower part for the second argument. We apply this and yeah. And so if you're interested in the JavaScript backend, uh, this file defines all the, all the primops so you can easily see uh, what's going on uh, with your Haskell code. Uh, we have a, a simple EDSL to yeah, to generate JavaScript. 
but when the, the, the expression is a bit too complex, we make some calls. So, yeah. So my understanding was that there aren't actually integers in JavaScript. Like you, don't, you, you have floating point numbers and that's, that's it, but yeah. you can represent a good number of integers precisely. Um, yeah. So how does, like, do we know that the 32-bit integers are fully covered and? Uh, uh, yeah, so um, JavaScript uh, number type is backed by a double um, uh, floating point uh, number. So the mantissa is uh, something like 64 bits. So we know that we can stash a 32-bit uh, integer into it, but not a 64-bit okay, okay. uh, yeah, integer. Yeah, and then, but not 64. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great, great. So we use two of them to... Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so uh, now let's see uh, the implementation of HS minus in 64. So we go into RTS JS. Yep. So it's defined in this file. Uh, so we have our arguments. Uh, so the thing that we are doing here is that we're creating a um, JavaScript big int, so that's the JavaScript implementation of big numbers. We perform the operation and uh, we return the result. So as I've mentioned already, we have some CPP, so the, the this thing uh, are used to, to create um, yeah, b the appropriate big, big int from the, the smaller part of the int64. Um, so this is quite slow. So if you are looking for things to do during the Zuriac, uh, we should try to avoid uh, using big int because uh, the, implementation <laughs> the, yeah, the implementation isn't good. So what I've already done in some cases is that we perform all the operation on a 16-bit uh, number instead. And so we avoid uh, using big int. Uh, we are, we are restricting ourselves to a smaller number, and it works. And it's much faster, so uh, yeah, that's uh, an idea for, for improvement. Uh, I've covered all of this. Any question? Is there a note describing the, uh, the integer um you know, treatment of integers, that would be a good thing to write, if so, if uh, not. The, the trick about uh, the, having a two? The, yeah, the two, the two words, and even just the fact that, you know, we, we can cover the integer, the 32-bit uh, integers with a single I think there JavaScript. is, so let's see. Um, more, more of a suggestion, I guess, or, or, or if the no, one no, doesn't I exist, think, yeah, I'm just I making sure. Yeah. I didn't catch that when I was uh, looking through it previously. Yeah, so um, uh, in the stg2js, oh. which is uh, the compiler, that is uh, not. So I've read it uh, last night. This, some of it is outdated, but uh, you have some, some things that are true. Um, yeah, so in 64 represented as two. Great. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. oh, okay. Another question? So uh, we'll now discuss a little bit the relation to JSHJS. So if you want, you can start uh, hacking on uh, what I've already said, what I mentioned exists, if you're not interested. So are, are there just, just uh, users yeah, here? One, <laughs> two, three, four, four, five, yeah, five, okay. So it's not uh, as, uh, as uh, popular as it was, I think. So um, for everyone, so the JSHJS was a project, uh, so an SQL to JavaScript compiler, it was an independent project. The, the idea was to support full Haskell, uh, not just uh, Haskell-ish syntax, but to try to really support real Haskell in the browser. And it was, yeah, the development started more than 10 years ago, and it has been used in production. And crucially, it relies on a fork of GSC. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, David. A uh, question from Jorge online. Can't big int primitive values be represented directly? And then there's a link to Mozilla MDN that I'm not going to read out loud. <laughs> uh, we could use big int, but the, the, as they are slow, uh, we're trying to avoid uh, creating, uh, creating this. Uh, number seems to be faster. Um, in fact, uh, even JavaScript optimized numbers that are in a specific range, if they are in the 32-bit range, um, the JavaScript JIT uh, thing 
we'll compile them to even faster code that if they are um, if they are floats basically, or out of the in32 uh, range. Um, so yeah, the idea is to have two values instead to to be faster. Okay, so um, yeah, so the JavaScript backend uh, reuse code from JS, but uh, one question could be. Why do we need the JS backend if we already have JS? So we'll see what issues um, JS and JS add and uh, how we compare to them with the JavaScript backend. So the first one is that uh, JS was difficult to build, so it relied on a fork of JS. Um, it had to build boot libraries and uh, it has its own it had its, its own build script. So um, yeah, it was quite complicated. Even impossible if you if you look uh, the commands on the internet. Um, another issue is that it was stuck on an old GHC. So I've mentioned that it was using a, a fork of GHC, and so every time GHC uh, was uh, being uh, released, uh, GHC had to keep up. So uh, the, the information I have is that in the early days it was easy because GHC uh, didn't e evolve that much. But it became a lot more difficult recently in the, the past few years. So, too many people working on JSC. Um, another issue was that JSC uh, lacked, lacked a CI, so it was a, yeah, um, later one of the author wanted to make some some um, important changing or refactoring, but without CI, it's always a bit um, <laughs> dangerous because you don't know what you will break. Um, so this we've, we've fixed it also by uh, with the JS backend because we reuse the JSC CI. Um, another point is that it lacked documentation, so it's not uh, perfect yet, uh, but it's a bit better. We've tried to write quite a few blog posts to understand what was going on in JS and um, yeah, in the new implementation, the JS backend. So yeah, if you see something that isn't uh, well documented, uh, open a ticket or uh, try to fix it. Uh, yeah, it would be much welcome. Um, another concern was that it was slow. Uh, so I've never used JSHGS, so I don't know, but apparently it was, it was slow. And uh, I think we have improved because, uh, as you've seen, uh, there's no major difference between compiling uh, native code and JavaScript code. It's the same order of mag magnitude, at least. Uh, um, and we haven't really uh, tried to optimize the JavaScript backend yet, so there may be some long fruit uh, um, in this space. So, yeah, contribution are welcome here too. Um, another point was that JS JS lacks man lack maintainers, so we'll see this a little bit later, but it has improved. And uh, <laughs> the only regression is that we produce code that is bigger than JS uh, JS, and uh, even at the, at the time it was considered too big. So we're working on this, but it's not ready yet. So. Let's see. So JS JS maintainer, so it was started more than 10 years ago. So first one was Victor Nadarov. Then Amish showed that uh, it was possible to implement Haskell in JavaScript. In fact, even words construct uh, uh, like uh, weak references or things like that. And then later uh, took off the maintenance. So if you look here, you can see later maintaining JS JS, where many people <coughs> built uh, libraries on top of it. And uh, and yeah, a whole, a whole ecosystem on top of it. Um, there, there were uh, obviously uh, contributors, but uh, the main maintainer has been uh, later. Uh, so nowadays it's a bit better because uh, yeah, in my team we are four, so uh, Jeff, Josh, and later and myself. And uh, the idea is that after the GSC workshop and the React, there will be even more contributors. So feel free to add your name to the list and uh, yeah. It's quite fun, so yeah, join. Um, another point I've mentioned is that it's not uh, much easier to to build uh, the JavaScript backend that it was to build JS. So you've received received already the build in, um, instructions. Sorry. Uh, so it's nearly identical to building JS. So we'll just quickly review uh, the change that uh, we need to do. So first, we need an uh, we need the M scripten toolchain. So it's a C to JavaScript toolchain. So I've said that we weren't using this. So why do we need this? 
Um, in fact, it's used because GHC assumes that uh, we have a valid C tool chain uh, for in its configure script and even a valid li linker. It's also used to derive some platform constant, uh, C constant that you can access then in uh, foreign C types, for example. Um, those are plus flat platform, platform dependent and uh, they use the C compiler to, to, to be produced in Haskell. Uh, then there is the HST to HS tool that also relies on uh, the C tool chain. And CPP also, the, the CPP of the C tool chain is used uh, on Haskell files and uh, also on the JavaScript files. Um, so I've added this line because it was mentioned you know, in an earlier talk. We usually we can use freeze one to rebuild the um, compiler uh, without rebuilding the stage one compiler, but you shouldn't do this for cross compiler because for now, uh, cross compiler has stage one compiler. If, so if you freeze, freeze one, if you freeze one, uh, you're not rebuilding your compiler. So yeah, keep in mind if you work on this, keep this in mind. Uh, so the build instruction, so we use a slash boot to prepare the build environment. Then we use im configure. So that's the thing from mscript10 that will put uh, the um, mscript10 tool in an environment variable, so in CC and LD, basically. And we have to specify the target, which is JavaScript unknown JHS. Um, then we call Adrian, as presented before. So you're free to use whatever flavor you want. Um, I, I recommend using no profile libs because uh, we don't support profiling, so you gain some time not building them. And more importantly, you need to use the native BigNum um, flavor transformer because it, um, it enables the, 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 Haskell, the, yeah, the BigNum backend written in Haskell, so it works with the JavaScript backend. Then you wait, you, you create your alias, and it's done. Yeah, Ben? What is the difference between that and just dash dash big num equals native? They're the same thing, I guess. Uh, they're the same thing. Oh, okay. All right. Just a uh, flavor transformer didn't exist when I did the big num. Yeah, right, right, thing, right. So. Yeah, maybe we should remove that. <laughs> we should remove it. So I've mentioned that we have uh, one major regression. Uh, it's that uh, we were producing code that is even bigger than the code that just just produced, which was already big. So why is it the case? So uh, the reason is that the JHS had a JavaScript optimizer. Uh, so it compiled STG to JavaScript. Then this is the optimizer. And then it pretty printed to the JavaScript code. And there are also <laughs> optimizations that were performed during this pretty printing phase. So what we've done is that uh, this, this optimization, sorry, have been implemented, so we now have a regular optimization pass for some of them. Some of them are still done at pretty printing time. Um, the disabled JS minifier thing I've shown before actually disables this optimization. But uh, we're still compiling from STG to the JavaScript IR directly, and we don't, we haven't ported this part, this optimizer. So according to Leuter, it was quite slow and brittle because it was matching on, a, on JavaScript things, so JavaScript function calls and things like that. So it was easy to miss a, a case when you're doing dependency analysis on, your, on the code. Um, and it was slow because it was matching on, on strings. So we want to redesign this and uh, yeah, to rewrite it basically. And the way we're thinking about doing it is by introducing an intermediate uh, representation between STG and JavaScript that would be like JavaScript, but with some high-level construct of the STG machine uh, still, um, yeah, still represented as a data constructor in the IR. Um, for example, uh, when you want to call black hole, you don't want to actually um, generate the, the call to the function black hole or to the content of the black hole function. You want to have a data constructor saying that, it's, uh, that it will be a, a call to black hole. And then you can move things around this function depending on what it uses. Yeah, so key takeaways for GHCJS user are that uh, the JS backend is based on GHCJS, but it isn't GHCJS, so you should expect some changes. Uh, we've mentioned the user interface won't be the same. 
um, internal structure is not exactly the same. Uh, and yeah, uh, we'll see some of them uh, later. And JSHS support is basically discontinued uh, in favor of the JS backend now. But uh, if you want to <laughs> maintain JS, uh, yeah, feel free. Um, but at the same time, the JS backend isn't fully production ready yet because, uh, especially of the regression we, we've mentioned, I've mentioned before. I will explain how we've um, uh, how we've implemented the JavaScript backend. Um, so before 2022, the idea was to make JS JS project the JS JS project converge toward JSC source-wise. So, um, uh, a lot of work has been put into uh, removing things that aren't allowed in JSC. So for example, in JSC, you're not allowed to use template Haskell. It was discussed uh, in a previous uh, session uh, because of staging issue. And JSC JS used uh, a quasi-quarter to generate JavaScript code. So all this has been removed and we now have uh, an EDSL. Yeah. Uh, question from Jorge. Uh, have you tried running a JS minifier on top of the generated JS? Yeah, and it didn't go well because, uh, at least on my example, maybe at some it will work, but it was it it, it crashed because of the output is too big. So. And the follow-up question just appeared: Were there any significant size changes? Uh, no, yes, there was no output. Okay. Uh, um, maybe it is possible. I don't remember the one I've tried, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, Google close your compiler might might work. Uh, I don't know, but um, yeah, I, I would prefer that we, if we generated better code in the first place, and also there are some things that are hidden to the, um, to the, to a JavaScript optimizer because they, um, they are about the STG machine, in fact, and the way you, we use global variables. Um, uh, we'll see that uh, later, or even the stack uh, things. So in the HTGS, uh, the work has, yeah, five minutes to. Um, Avoid template Haskell, so it was replaced with a normal EDSL. To use, uh, um, to remove some libraries because JSC has a limited set of libraries in, it can use called the boot libraries. So, for example, JSGS was using lenses all over the place, so this has been removed. Um, and it was also upgraded uh, from using JSC 8.6 to JSC 8.10. So this was before I was put in charge of doing, uh, of implementing this. Uh, so when I was put in charge of uh, implementing, the, of merging JSJS into JSJ, I thought that is, it wouldn't go well because, um, yeah, the, the code was too big. So it was, yeah. So we, uh, we've decided to change the, the approach. So instead, we've considered JSJS as a working prototype, and we've implemented uh, the JS backend uh, as if it was a new backend. But reusing JS code. Um, yeah, I do I have time? So yeah, I'll present this quickly. So as Cheng mentioned yesterday, when you start a new backend, you generate some code either from CMM or from STG, and it's quite easy, in fact. Uh, so you're confident that uh, you're done, but in fact, that's just the first part, the easy part. So the second milestone I've set was to build a working Hello World program. And this brings everything else. So you need the URTS, the linker, uh, boot libraries working. Uh, because it's using I.O., you need um, everything related to I.O. in GSC to work. So that's really drawing the rest of the whole. Uh, it took a long time. And then the third step was uh, we have uh, added CI and we made it pass the test suite. Uh, so some tests uh, are still disabled, uh, even now. Um, because they are legitimately broken or because they are, they are, they are, they are real bugs. So if you want to contribute also, you can look at the, the, the things that are still broken for the JS backend in the test suite and fix them. Try to fix them or help. There should be a, a GitLab ticket for each of them. So, um, uh, JSC 9.8, that is, uh, that will be the next version. So we've implemented some uh, FFE callbacks. So that's like foreign export, but a bit different. Uh, I'll refer you to the user's guide. Um, and we've uh, a merge request that implement template Haskell that we hope to get merged into JSC 9.8. So hopefully 9.8 should be the first uh, non-toy proof of concept version of the JS backend. <laughs> so it should be pretty cool. Um, 
And yeah, you can find the rest of the roadmap uh, on the wiki. Um, for night end, we have a great plan, but uh, we've made some progress on every attempt. Uh, so template scale almost done. Uh, reducing code size, uh, it has been done with the magnifier thing, um, uh, at least in partly. Uh, making the JS backend faster, it has been, uh, yeah, it's in progress, uh, in progress, in progress. So this will drift a little bit, but um, yeah, you've got the idea. And then in the long term, there are other things that we would like to do. Um, uh, yeah, some uh, better FFI interface, uh, re-implementing profiling. So Omer um, uh, implemented profiling in uh, JS a long time ago, uh, but uh, we didn't port it, uh, or at least we haven't tried it. So maybe it works, but I don't think so. So this is something we should uh, fix. Uh, we could uh, implement support for JSCI, including debugging. And um, yeah, that's something that we have already started is that uh, porting the JSCJS environment. Uh, all the libraries that JSCJS had, uh, uh, which should make them work with the JS backend. Actually, speaking about questions, there was one question on the on Discord about uh, the shape of the generated JavaScript, uh, asking if it was more uh, Lispy style or uh, a functional style or imperative style. So it's really imperative style, just like uh, the native backend is doing uh, when it generates uh, assembly code. Uh, we're really following the same the same structure of, of the code, uh, the STG machine implemented for uh, uh, stock hardware. <coughs> Let's switch. So, uh, so yeah, JSCJS uh, had a huge ecosystem uh, at some point. It still, uh, yeah, still has. So my, my initial plan was to use some of the JSCJS uh, um, libraries, such as uh, Shine, which is a kind of gloss, but for the JavaScript, um, and to do a nice demo. But uh, it isn't yet possible, because we need to update all those libraries uh, for the JS backend. Uh, and also because they were stuck to GSC8, uh, we need to update them to, to the changes that happened independently uh, in GSC since, since then. And one thing that we need to fix is that all the FF, almost all of the FFI calls uh, need to be rewritten. So I'll detail this. So in uh, GSC uh, so yeah, the first uh, foreign import uh, for the JavaScript backend look like this, where the, as usual, foreign import. But we use the JavaScript calling convention. Um, then we have our JavaScript uh, bit here, with the name of the function and the type signature. Um, yeah. And so what um, JSHGS was doing is that it was supporting an inline syntax. So those dollar uh, one, dollar two are in fact placeholders for element of the function. And uh, to support this, it had a, a JavaScript parser and um, a lot of stuff. So we didn't port this. So if you want to do uh, to have this kind of code, you need to use um, an anonymous function in JavaScript. So the syntax is uh, like this: you have your parameter x and y, the double arrow, and the, the code that perform exactly the same operation. And so your argument uh, for JSX will be applied to this whole thing. And um, yeah, that's how you would uh, write the, the equivalent code uh, with the JS backend. So <laughs> that's uh, one of the tasks if you want to use uh, all JS, JS libraries, rewrite um, um, uh, these foreign imports. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, can they be beta reduced? And um, uh, no, uh, yeah, I was planning to implement some optimization to do this in the after, uh, when we can prove that the uh, the right hand side of the function uh, is valid. Uh, but uh, yeah, for now, we don't yet have reduced, so it's a little bit slower to have the second form instead of the first form. But uh, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, can, uh, what's the current state of uh, updating the libraries um, to the JavaScript backend? Uh, so we've started with the root, which is a JSJS base. And we're, uh, we're currently in the process of fixing this one. 
and then there are um, uh, just a JS DOM, uh, and then a lot of them on top of it, uh, JSADL. Right, so cu currently it's not like possible to write a GUI application yet. Not or using this library. library. Okay. You okay. can do it manually. Uh, I'll sure, thank you. Just after, yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the idea is to update those libraries so that uh, we can benefit from them. Um, yeah, so those are the reasons why we didn't uh, implement a JavaScript parser. It was a little, yeah, it could have been controversial to add a, a parser and to, to have a specific um, behavior for JavaScript compared to native code. So, uh, so and, uh, yeah, and also we wanted to coordinate with the WASM backend to see if we could have the same syntax so that we could, you could use the same code for both backends. And so this will need uh, some thinking, some design, and probably a GHC proposal now. So. Yeah. Okay. So instead of the shiny uh, demo, uh, we'll try to do something with, uh, in the STG example um, uh, that is on the, in the Git repository. So let's see. Uh, let's start with the Kabul file. So I've just uh, added a dependency on SVG Builder, which is a library in a cage. And uh, the, the code is, uh, is directly taken from SVG Builder uh, repository. So it's the, um, one of the examples they have. Uh, so it's producing a SVG um, a document uh, using this syntax. And the, the thing it does is that it print it on the console. So let's build it, uh, cable build. So yeah. This, this is the native code generator, and it just prints the SVG on the console. So now, if we want to use the JavaScript backend to do this, we, no, we need to tell Cabal uh, where to find GHC, in fact. So this can be done with this. Uh, you call Cabal, build, and when you say with GHC, give the pass to your GHC. And you also, you also need to tell him, uh, to tell it where to find GHC package. Uh, which is uh, right next to GHG. And we pass alone newer because we're on uh, master, so we need to avoid uh, dependency conflicts. So, okay, let's try. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, to execute it, you, you have to find where it has been generated. So I have the script that does judge this. Um, oh. Ooh, but we have an error with JavaScript backend. So um, once you get uh, used to this kind of error, is that you, you, know, you will know that uh, the reference here, it, it is trying to find a function that doesn't exist. So that's because we are using the Hable library some, somewhere in the dependencies, and it uses a C function called Hable FNV hash offset. And we don't have this because we don't compile C code to, to JavaScript. So actually, I've copied this function. So the Hable FNV hash offset is just this function, and it calls into Hable FNV hash. There's a question. Yeah. Why did this fail at runtime and not at compile time? Yes, because uh, we don't, uh, JavaScript doesn't do, uh, um, the linking phase doesn't check if symbol exists or. Uh, um, so so, so we're, we're delegating to some other process to do that, to do the linking? Uh, no, no, it's just that uh, we'll only fail when we try to enter the function. Um, we don't but check that it exists. We, we haven't written the linker why can't we write something that checks for the symbols? Uh, could we do this? Per, perhaps we could. Yes, we wrote the linker, but we would have to pass the JavaScript that we are linking and trying to find if it exists. So yeah, perhaps it could be improved. Oh, so the problem is that if you look at a, the JavaScript module you're linking against, you don't know what symbols it provides? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. that's sad. <laughs> that uh, in one way it's sad because uh, it doesn't work. It, uh, if it, um, it doesn't crash at compilation time, 
But in another way, we can build many libraries that, with missing symbols. As long as you don't use them, <laughs> it's, okay. it's JavaScript, so <laughs> that's the kind of thing we can do. Time checks. Uh, so let's see, we have this um, uh, this function in C. So what I've done is that I rewrote it in, uh, oh, in JavaScript. So we can use CPP, so we define the same thing. Um, something to note is that here there is a pointer. So in JavaScript, we need two variables to represent the pointer, uh, the array and the offset. Uh, then the offset argument, the length argument, the salt argument, and we make a function call exactly the same thing. And this function is a little bit more interesting. Uh, it's basically the same code except for the dereferencing of the str pointer. Uh, in JavaScript, it will be written like this. Um, we, we have a str a array and with a buffer proper C and we just use the offset to, um, to index into it and get the byte, and we perform the operation. And this little thing here is to convert a JavaScript number into uh, an insane, insane in 32 number. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's a, a right shift, insane right shift of zero, and that's the, <laughs> the proper way to do this in JavaScript. So let's check uh, with this. Um, so we want, now we want to compile um, with this file um, uh, linked with the, the, the global thing. So the normal way to do this would be to add JS sources like this in our Cabal file. But there is a little bug in, in Cabal. It doesn't work if your component is an executable for now. It only works if your component is a library. Uh, so this is something we have to fix. Uh, but uh, in the medium term, short term even, it should, be, it should be the proper way to do this. But for now, what we can do is that we can just pass the JavaScript file to GHC as an additional argument, and it will be linked with the, the rest. Let's try this. Uh, build. Let's try to run. Oh, no, we have another reference error. It's because we depend on byte string, and at some point we call byte string is valid UTF-8, and we don't have the function. So the function prototype, I've copied it here. Um, we just have um, a buffer with its length, and we are returning one if it's a valid UTF-8 buffer. So same thing. Um, so I found, found some, some code on the internet to validate a UTF-8 buffer in JavaScript. <coughs> uh, I hope it works. And then you just have to write the, the function that is expected by uh, the Haskell code. So yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, when we are doing a, a foreign import um, that is not a JavaScript a foreign import, uh, we add this prefix h dollar just to, to avoid name conflicts, something like that. Yeah. So same thing, we, we have our, our pointer, our source pointer, our buffer pointer, sorry. Um, so composed of two parts, the array and the offset, the length we call uh, valid eight, and we return one or zero, depending on the result. Let's rebuild. Is there any question while it's building? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you think we could use mscripten to automatically compile C bits to JavaScript? Yes, yeah, so that's what uh, one of the possible uh, one of the ideas we had to to fix this. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, then you have to generate some blue code between the mscripten thing and the JavaScript thing, and um, yeah, the way the heap is managed, especially with pointer like this, we'd have to marshal some data into the mscripten heap and then back. And so it's not trivial. So <laughs> we, that's some idea we have, but uh, for now we have to, to write this like this. Any other question? No. So let's try to run it. Who? It works. But we don't really see what the image is displaying, so let's change this to uh, actually print it in the browser. So uh, where is my function? So instead of printing it in the console, 
will just uh, create a new foreign import here. Okay, so this one is a foreign import that take a pointer that will be a, a C string, in fact. And what it does is that it replaces the document body with the content of the string decoded as UTF-8. This is uh, provided by the RTS. And we call this on the or Haskell string. So to recap, we have our SVG uh, thing. We, we generate a string from it. Then we put it into um, uh, as a C string, so in a, in, a, in a buffer. And then we call JavaScript on this buffer. And this one will decode it as a JavaScript string and assign it to the document um, in our HTML. To the, yeah, we'll replace the body of the document. So let's try this. So yeah, if we call run. No, I didn't build. <laughs> let's call run. So this time, it doesn't work because document is not defined. It's our document.body. Uh, but because we are running in Node.js and we don't have access to the browser. So instead, let's run it into a, a browser. So I have this script that just loads the index.html file that uh, I've mentioned before. So let's do this. And woo, it works. It's uh, impressive. Um, and yeah, so that's the, yeah, so this shows you how to update some libraries. Ideally, we won't do this in our project. We will uh, update Ashable and by string to, to provide a JavaScript alternative or Haskell alternative to their C uh, sources, in fact. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing. If you try to build something and it's broken, uh, please contribute to upstream libraries to, to, fix, uh, to fix them. Yep, Brian? Fix by string or, not, or whatever it was, Hashable. Like, do you like? Is there already a way that's not a hacky way to to update those those packages now so that they would work with? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so the code I wrote in the helper.js, this function could be added. Um, uh, this file, in fact, could be added into um, the Ashable package. And uh, in uh, your Cabal file, uh, let's see uh, this one. Um, we would do as in uh, in base, for example where we have a conditional for JavaScript. So where we're running JavaScript, we load some, uh, we will link the JavaScript file. Uh, so we would do exactly the same thing for Hable and for ByteString uh, to provide alternative if we want to write them directly in JavaScript. Or another thing could be to write them in Haskell uh, to provide a Haskell alternative. Because yeah, the, for example, the FNV1, let's see. Uh, no. Uh, the FNV1 could be easily written in Haskell. The only reason it's not written is in Haskell is that it's probably more performant in C because you will have a loop uh, in rolling and uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, for the JavaScript backend, we, it won't make a difference. So it would be better to write it in, in Haskell so that when we'll have a JVM backend after this week, uh, it will directly work, so that would be great. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the internals. Um, so yeah, the execution models, so that's cool, that, uh, that's great that uh, Ben did the, the talk about the STG machine before, about the RTS, because it's almost exactly the same thing. Uh, we have the STG machine, but in JavaScript. So we have registers. Uh, for this, we use uh, JavaScript global variables. We have the Haskell stack. We use a JavaScript array. And we have heap object. And this is where there is a difference. Because instead of having um, to manage uh, heap, so instead of having a storage manager, uh, as in the native uh, RTS, we rely on the JavaScript uh, heap um, to do this for us. So our, our Haskell heap object are JavaScript heap object. In fact and we rely on the garbage collector of the JavaScript. So yeah, let's see this uh, little bit in the RTS file. Yeah. Maybe you can answer later because it might be complex, but I'm wondering why you chose the approach of keeping the 
registers as global registers when the target is JavaScript that doesn't have any registers by default. Yeah, but we wanted to keep the same model, uh, so we needed to have uh, some, uh, yeah, some, <laughs> some global register. Um, yeah, how, how would you implement it otherwise? Um, yeah, the STG mach machine rely on having some register. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the cool thing about JavaScript is that we can have as many registers as we want. Uh, because they are just global variables, so so yeah, uh, yeah I don't have a better answer. Uh, let's see. No, not this. No, let's check. So previously, previously we've built this. Okay, so this is the. The beginning of the RTS.js file, the generated uh, RTS one. Um, so just like in the native RTS, we had a current TSO uh, register. So here we have current thread. We have our uh, stack and uh, the stack pointer. Uh, there are some other things related to to listing calves, but I won't get into that. And then we have all the register R1, R2, uh, until R32. Uh, so that's what we'll use to implement the G-Machine. Yeah, one question. Instead of using global variables, could you enclose the, the whole program in a Lambda so that they, would, uh, they wouldn't escape that scope, but they would be global within that, <laughs> within uh, that Lambda? Perhaps we could. Uh, yeah, but uh, one issue with this is that, uh, I won't get too much into that, but for template as scale, where actually uh, we have a program, a JavaScript program, and we are incrementally linking stuff into it. So the, the code we had, we don't have access to this variable, uh, I guess. Uh, I can see this becoming a problem. Uh, while here we have, everything is global, so when Well, we I'm just thinking of what if you have, uh, what if you load two Haskell programs into the same web page? They, mm. they might conflict, you know, the, the uh, registers. Yes. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, I don't have a good answer to this. Uh, yeah, perhaps with module system, things yeah. like that perhaps could do something. But uh, then you would have to concurrent uh, ask a thing. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> what's yeah. the best way to, Thanks. to deal with this. That's a good cool question. Yeah. Take Very good question, yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, yes. Ooh. So um, yesterday we've seen a STG object in the heap. So we had constructor, function, sunks, partial application, black holes. So we have the same thing in the JavaScript backend. And in JavaScript, a heap object like this is represented as a JavaScript object with uh, those fields. So F, D1, D2, and M. So F is uh, the info table uh, of the um, of the object, if you remember from yesterday, so that the the shared property of the object holds the closure that we uh, yeah several closures can share this same info table, and in particular there is an entry function when you want to evaluate this closure you enter the, the entry function that is here. Uh, D1 and D2 uh, are the payload of the closure, so depending on the information in the info table especially the kind of uh, closure we have, uh, the payload will be different. So for example, if it's a constructor, um, we will have the, the content of the fields of the, of the, yeah, of the constructor. Uh, if it's a function, we'll have uh, free variables or um, things like that. Uh, same thing for things, we have the captured uh, free variables. The, and the last field yeah, the, uh, is a mark for the heap traversal. So this is something a little bit Technical is that we rely on the, uh, ja on the JavaScript garbage collector for almost everything, but there are some things that we can't, uh, yeah, the JavaScript garbage collector doesn't provide some features that we need to implement, for example, weak references and finalizer. Uh, so um, at uh, a regular frequencies, frequency, um, we run a heap traversal that traverse all the objects in the heap and check which ones are reachable. And those that are not reachable, uh, then we can, we can run the finalizer and um, things like that. 
Uh, yeah, we were working on improving this actually because the recent uh, JavaScript, JavaScript um, uh, 2018, as they did the support from weak references and finalizer, but not exactly with the semantics we need for Haskell, uh, at least uh, for weak references, weak references as we have in Haskell. So, um, yeah, Leute is working on uh, trying to make them match to Im improve the performance because uh, if traversal is obviously costly. And so, yeah. so why are we doing this? If it's costly, <laughs> we could never run the final laser, but uh, actually it was useful to implement some uh, libraries in the past in JS, uh, functional reactive programming uh, libraries such as Reflex uh, required these kind of things. So. Okay, so another demo called constructors. Let's see. Uh, constructors. So I will show you uh, the, how the heap objects are represented in JavaScript. So we'll have uh, several ones. So nothing will be a, construct, a data constructor with uh, no argument. Just five will have one argument. We'll have some CAF, so it's something that can be evaluated and uh, replaced by its uh, results. And we'll see all this. Uh, oops. Uh, yes, still have this. Constructor uh, force recount. Um, we'll need the dump stg final, the dump to file. No typeable. Binds should be okay. So what did I plan to show? Yeah, no optimization. So we have seen the Haskell code. Let's see the STG code. Oh, actually, let's use the suppress all to make the STG code a little bit uh, easier to digest. Okay. So. We'll have the st static uh, heap object. We'll have nothing, uh, just five, which I uh, use also just one um, as, a, as a payload ar argument. And uh, uh, the CAF is here, some CAF. So as we've seen yesterday, it's an updatable uh, thingy. So we will we'll run this and re replace it with the, the result. <clears throat> so let's see in JavaScript what it looks like. So the first one is nothing. Yeah, it's visible. So uh, in JavaScript, so we'll have a variable. Uh, so it's prefixed with the, um, the name of the unit, the unit ID, in fact. Uh, this is the Z encoding for column. Then we have the name of the module, main. This is Z encoding for a dot. And uh, we have nothing. And so this is the it will first create uh, an empty closure. So that's what the function does. So let's see, dollar hd, yep. which call dollar hc. And so, mm, oh, I forgot one thing, it's ugly. Uh, I need to disable just minifier. No, not this one. Yeah, you can. Uh, so, contract star. Nothing, nothing. So, yeah, we are following the, the tracks of first dollar D. It creates an, an empty constructor. Then dollar C. Okay, so we are creating here our object with the payload D1 nul, D2 nul. The function we're passing f equal null, so it will be null also, and the mark is zero. Okay. And then, what are we doing with it? Later in the in the code, we're uh, we're actually giving it its proper shape. So we will give it. Um, we'll use this as a, an info table. Uh, so this is the nothing constru constructor info table. Um, yeah. Is there something to see? Yeah. So it's at the same time a function 
as we see here. When we enter it, we just return. It has nothing to do. And oh, no, let's go back. And uh, in JavaScript, you can give properties to functions. So here, that's what we're doing. We're setting the field of the info table. So we're setting something on this function. We're giving it uh, uh, the shape of the argument and things like that. So, Info table property, but I won't give details about this. Um, okay. And yes, yeah, so sty, let's see what it does. H sty. So it's just assigning the f field, so the info table field with uh, the argument, and then call init closure. Um, Init, init closure, no, underscore closure, yeah. So this is a function that will store the payload. So we, we have a list of um, JavaScript um, expression in the payload. And we always use two fields, uh, D1 and D2. So it will depend on the length of the, of the list, how we'll store the payload. Uh, if we have only uh, one value, we'll store it into the first one. If we have two values, we'll store into D1 and D2. And then if we, are more th th if we have more than two values of pay payload, uh, we'll use uh, uh, an object in D2 uh, to store the rest, in fact. So this is a bit of a word encoding, but it's to, to, only have, to always have the same shape for heap objects. They all have uh, uh, two fields, D1 and D2. Uh, so when later when we want to update a, a, a heap object for a sync, basically, we just have to update these fields, not uh, all the other fields. Okay, so we've seen nothing. So then just one oh, is almost the same, except that we have uh, we have one one uh, one parameter of payload. So yeah, that's O five O value five, which is a an integer, a small integer, with the value five. Yep, Michael. So all of this stuff, like all of the stuff, it it sounds like it's probably typeable, except maybe that payload thing. Would it be at all useful to go through, I don't know, like TypeScript or something, just for like basic types in order to sanity check the emitted code before so, turning it into JavaScript in the end? Exactly. So that was the second suggestion by David. By yeah. David, was to, we could generate a, we could generate a type tree information. Uh, yeah, it could be useful to, to do this. Yeah, just so you don't accidentally put the info table in the payload or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. Sure. So yeah, that could be uh, that. Uh, yeah, in my list of the potential contribution that could be made at the end of the talks. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, so so yeah, we've seen nothing, just five. And the last one, if we remember. So we had a calf, so some calf. Where is it? Uh, no, let's go back to the top. Where is it? Yeah, here. So we have some calf. Uh, it's just some. So yeah, this is the initial initialization code for the the calf object. So we have the calf. Uh, we have the entry of the calf, and the, the thing it depends on. Um, this is used to, yeah, for the heap traversal I've talked about before, to know uh, things that are still alive. So let's look at the entry code of the function. So when we enter some calf, so this is this, um, we'll get the, the argument. Yeah, we get the global things. Then we call black hole bh is to black hole the current uh, the current uh, heap object. So let's see black hole. What does it do? It push an update frame on the stack and the current uh, node it is updating. So the the sync and it updates uh, r1 so the current node with a black hole. It stores the current thread um, into d1. So Exactly as in the STG, uh, as in the native backend yesterday. Um, when you update something, we want to to know which thread is actually uh, updating the thing. 
so that uh, yeah, we can block until it is evaluated when uh, we are in another thread. So um, yeah, and we are using eager black holing. We are always black holing. We don't wait for the thread to be uh, uh, descheduled uh, to be uh, to update all the the thing it was updating. Okay, so we black hole the thing and then we apply the sum to folder list to num in to sat. So this is exactly this. Yes, just to give you an idea of how all this works. Um, and now I'll show you that uh, with the JavaScript uh, <laughs> backend, we can actually modify the JavaScript code uh, that we have. Uh, so before entering the function, before entering the entry point at the end of the, pro of the, of the file, we can actually uh, dump uh, anything. So I'll dump uh, just five, for example. Uh, um, constructors. And so we can see um, we have our DR1 field, D2 field, and F is uh, the, 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 the info table and the function at the same time for the just constructor. And the info, info table is here, the, the field of the info table are here. So it gives the type of the info table, um, the RET, and yeah, other stuff like this um, here. Uh, let's dump. Uh, oh no, I have a better thing for this. Um, so here we've modified the JavaScript file, but we don't have to do it here. We can do it directly in Haskell. So for example, if I want to dump the calf before and after it is evaluated, I can write a foreign import that just does the thing I want. Uh, that is log yeah, printing on the console uh, the, the calf uh, object. So let's do this. Constructor. Oh, I need to recompile this time. Um, yeah, alias. Mm -hmm. So, yay, it worked. So, this is before the evaluation of the of the sunk. We our heap object look like this. So, we have some calf, the entry function with its info table. Its payload is D1 here. So, yeah, these things. And then D2, there are two other things in the payload. Um, we evaluate the, the, yeah, the program prints uh, the, the evaluated calf. And then we redump the, the same object, but this time it has been evaluated. It's uh, an integer, a small integer, whose payload is 55. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a bit. Uh, <laughs> A bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit hacky and things like that, but uh, if you want to understand something about the, the behavior of the, of the execution, you can easily add things like this. So it's quite cool to, to debug, to understand what's going on, uh, uh, to have a better intuition of how the, how the STG machine work, works. Yeah, I've presented this a little bit already. Um, how do we map pr primitive types, Haskell primitive types to JavaScript? So all the small numbers that fit into uh, JavaScript numbers uh, are mapped to JavaScript numbers. Float double fit, so they are mapped to JavaScript number. 64 um, bits uh, values use uh, two numbers. Uh, then we have byte array, they use a uh, JavaScript array buffer. Uh, Haskell array use JavaScript array. All the zoo of special heap value, uh, such as mvar, street ID, weak references, things like that, they all have a different kind of, a, of JavaScript object. Um, um, yeah. And finally, there is uh, the one that, uh, that is a bit, little bit uh, hard to deal with, address hash. So this one is represented by an array buffer and a number, it's offset. So uh, as I've mentioned before, it's not just a number in JavaScript. Um, Let's see. Um, print example. Yep. So print example. What is this? So yeah. 
we have, we'll, just, we'll just look, uh, we have a, a function bar that takes no argument, this is void, and returns a word32, word64, word a float, and an address. So let's see. Uh, for those primitive types, uh, if the JavaScript type is bigger than the Haskell type, you manually implement overflow mechanics. Um, you mean uh, um, narrow, narrowing, in fact, the, the types? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we narrow so that we have the semantics of the Haskell thing. Yeah. yeah. No, except for float. Uh, float is represented as a double in JavaScript. <coughs> So you have some, uh, you have more precision that, uh, than with a normal float. Perhaps in, perhaps in some cases we, we deal with, we, we narrow it, but I'm not sure. So, uh, uh, so yeah, the print thing. So I already have it compiled. Uh, so let's see, the bar function is here. Oh no, it's, it's ugly. Yep. Now where is it? Yeah. Okay, so our bar function, when we enter it, we will assign. Uh, uh, let's see. We have our value thirty-two here that will be assigned to the first register. We have this uh, word uh, sixty-four value, so the higher part will be will be assigned to one register and the lower part to the next one. Then a uh, float value it will be assigned to a register, and then uh, we have an address. Uh, pointer. So the first part, yes, it, here is a null address. So uh, the array buffer will be null, and the offset is zero. And that's that's how it works. Um, yeah. Okay. So now let's see another example with um, address. So we'll malloc. Two buffers, two different buffers of four bytes. We'll uh, put uh, two different values into them. We'll print the address and then we'll pick the value. So let's see what happens. So when we print the address of our malloc buffer, they are both zeros because, in fact, we only print the offset. We don't print the array buffer um, uh, representing them in JavaScript. And, but uh, when, we pick the, when we pick the values, we get back the values we've put in them. Um, so let's see this. If we try to, to dump, as I've done before, uh, the, the, the address, um, yeah, the JavaScript object representing the address. Yep. Let's run it, okay. So here we are printing the first uh, address. So it's composed of this array buffer. In fact, uh, we have also some views of, on this array buffer. Uh, so but the actual content is here. So the one is here. The one that we've put here, that we've put uh, here ends up here. Those are view on this same array. Um, ta -ta -ta -ta. And then we have the offset of zero. Um, if we increment um, an address in Haskell, for example, uh, of seven, seven bytes, uh, when we print it, we get seven. But if we print the, this uh, updated address, it's always the same array. Uh, yeah, the first part is always the same, but uh, the offset has been uh, increased to seven. So all of this to say that you must be careful with the pointer arithmetic when you use, you use the JavaScript backend because they don't share the two pointers don't share the same uh, the same backing uh, memory, so it may not work. Yeah, question here. Uh, when do they share the same array? Is it when they come from the same allocation? 
sort of. Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah, you can reuse the same one. And uh, for example, um, when here, when I'm increasing x by seven, uh, the backing array is the same for this new pointer that it was for x, for example. Um, we only increase the offset. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, we so don't have like, a global memory. <laughs> yeah, so within objects, you have those byte arrays. Yeah. Um, but they're not like related to each other. No, no, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And we we need to have this kind of things because we have primops in GHC such as uh, let's see GHC built-in primops takes uh, byte array byte array contents for example we can convert a byte array into an, a pointer. And uh, we can do this without storing somehow the byte array in the address in, on the JavaScript backend. Uh, I don't know if it makes sense. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's some kind of primops that are not really good for the JavaScript backend. So perhaps we should we could change something, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> So one of the last topic I wanted to talk about is the scheduler. So it's a, uh, as was presented yesterday, uh, the STG machine is usually implemented yeah, with uh, tail calls or go to uh, between um, blocks of code. We don't call a function and, and, and return back to the caller. So, um, so yeah, that's an issue also for us because uh, JavaScript engine don't support tail calls. There have been some proposal and they have been disabled. So yes, we don't have tail calls, and we can we can't implement uh, whole tail calls with normal uh, JavaScript calls. Otherwise, we would uh, quickly blow the JavaScript stack uh, call stack. So what the JavaScript backend does is that uh, um, yeah, we have seen this. All the functions are represented as a zero argument JavaScript function. Arguments are passed as global variable. And this function returns their own, their own continuation. Um, <coughs> so that's why it's great to have a zero argument JS function because we can return them directly without creating a new closure or something like that. It's a uh, chip. And uh, basically, what the scheduler is doing is that we have a, a, an infinite loop that call here C is a JavaScript function representing an Haskell, yeah, an Haskell function. And it returns its own continuation, and the next iteration of the loop will uh, evaluate this continuation and this infinitely. So that's the basic idea of trampolining in the scheduler. So let's see how it's done actually. Uh, RTS, GS, thread. Ooh. Run, let's slice. So let's some documentation. But the important thing that we can almost see is that we have C equals C. Actually, we have it a bunch of times because it was it is cheaper to do this a bunch of times before checking. Um, yeah, I will show this on a real example. Um, yeah, fun. Let's see. Do I have this? Yep. Uh, so this is the magic invocation. Um, so we have our almost infinite uh, while loop uh, that uh, with the C continuation. And uh, while it's not a specific value, we just, uh, we just enter the continuation. And so, uh, yeah. So let's see this last example, fun.hs. So we just have a simple function and that add 10 to a given argument. And we call it with uh, argument five. Uh, <coughs> so what was the plan? Blah, blah, blah. Show us TG. Yeah. So this is, or, oh no, that's not the right one. I need to recompile. Okay, or a scale code, or STG code. Um, yep. Uh, no. Yep. 
we'll, we'll look at the JavaScript code for the function at 10. So, oops, it was here. Do we have it? No. Oh, I'm using optimization. No, no, no. Mm -mm. So why are we pushing a continuation in the stack? Um, there's something fishy here. Yeah. Uh, ten. Oh, yeah. I didn't reload the user code, so that was this. Um, so yeah, our, our function, yeah, just actually its argument apply a plus to numain to x to sat, just like this. And this function will return the continuation. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want, to, you can make the, the x strict in here. Yep. With a, a bang. Let's see what this gives. So, if we have a case expression like this, our function, our JavaScript function will change also. Uh, so here we have um, we have hex that is passed as a first argument, so it is in R2. We'll uh, store it in a local variable. We push a continuation. This is this main thing that P1 is pushing something on the stack, and we enter the x, so that's the evaluation of x here. And then we return to this, uh, this continuation. Um, so, yeah. We don't have much time, so let's see. What's cool with JavaScript is that if you want to debug something, you can, you can monkey patch the JavaScript thing. And so, here, we're printing all the functions that are entered uh, one after the other. Um, we can oh, we can print only the name. So it's a bit uh, like GHC debug, it's, except that you don't have to recompile anything. You can uh, observe um, anything you want uh, like this. Uh, yeah. You only want to dump the main function, so you, you can see how the execution is going. So if you want to understand how the STG machine works, it can also be useful to, to do things like this. It's ugly, no problem, but uh, <laughs> it, it's quite easy. Um, so I've barely scratched the things about the, how the Haskell stack works, something like that. It's quite complicated, so there's a nice blog post by Leute about this, so if you want to read it, um, yeah. Um, let's keep template Haskell, it works. We, we have a Node.js process. Uh, that run a script and then we communicate with GSC with this Node.js process and we evaluate template scale splices like this. Yeah. Scheduling. Sorry. Does it still only yield during allocation? Uh, no, uh, actually. Uh, this one is using the, the date and so there is a sketch quantum thing. Uh, so it, it's... Okay. Um, it's Using well, I wasn't sure when it calls C, is it? Because it obviously can't be preempted while it's it's running that continuation. Um, does that execute until it hits a, a point of allocation? Um, so not, not necessarily because we run something, we get back to the temporal line, we get back, we always come yeah. back to this temporal line thing. So we have this first loop uh, to yeah, to do some, some work without being uh, preempted, but then the, uh, after some time, after some uh, iteration, we we get into this other loop, which will, <coughs> will check the time uh, to see if we need to be prompted uh, according to the time. So when we explicitly explicitly yield to the scheduler, uh, we have uh, the continuation set to reschedule, but otherwise the scheduling is based on, on time. Uh, because the allocation, we don't have, um, we are not managing the heap ourselves. So right. We don't get out of heap. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for the question. So yeah, template as care. We can discuss this after. Um, yeah, so this is an overview of all the parts of the JavaScript backend, and um, 
yeah, uh, but uh, you can read the slide if you're interested. And then the final thing, contribution ideas. So the first thing is that uh, if you want to build cool stuff with it, and uh, you should try, and then try to fix the issues we, you face. <laughs> Um, with uh, upstream libraries, as I've shown, uh, the C sources, for example, or even in, in the code generator. Um, profiling the, the, the backend also will be useful, uh, as I we've, din, we've done in the previous session. So replacing begint with a better uh, primop implementation, uh, you could make a, a contribution uh, easily. Uh, yeah, just by replacing some some JavaScript function, um, fixing the test suite. Uh, so there are some tests that are all marked as just broken. Uh, yeah, implementing some feature of the on the roadmap basically. Uh, so the link has been given on the on Discord, but all the tickets related to the JavaScript backend should be labeled with the JavaScript label. Um, so those are the two suggestions by David, and that were made during the session. So. Uh, supporting generating uh, TypeScript, uh, TypeScript uh, and the annotation, sorry, and uh, source maps also. Um, yeah, this one is a little bit trickier. Yeah, there will be a talk during the React by Alexis about delimited continuation. We don't have support for delimited continuation yet in the JavaScript backend because uh, the PlimoP hasn't been implemented. So if you want to practice what will be discussed in the talk, yeah, feel free. It will be great, greatly appreciated. And uh, yeah, if you have other ideas, uh, feel free to contact us. And uh, yeah, to contact us, uh, either on GHC's GitLab or mainnet, or usual channels. Where, where do I encounter this? Uh, so like for the, when you're doing the pass, I guess for uh, like STG, where do you like often have to like avoid using the byte array to pointer? Oh. Uh, where is it used in code, for example, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, it's, it's used for, uh, for, for high performance things. You usually, when you want to call uh, um, some C function on a byte array, uh, you can make an unsafe FFI, FFI call. And uh, I think it's using uh, this under the hood uh, to, get the, um, to get the pointer. And, uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, so, yeah, some other people uh, use it because sometimes it's simpler to work with addresses and to work with uh, the primops for the byte array. So uh, yeah, 